And I'm going to facilitate this final session this afternoon on parking management and parking technology. Parking management and parking technology really go hand in hand. You know, I spend a lot of time doing operational analysis with Walker Parking Consultants, and we make a lot of recommendations on improving operations and management. And just about every time, there's always some type of technology that we would recommend be implemented. Wireless communications and computers have really revolutionized uh, the parking business as well as every other, as well as every other business. You know. And that reminds me, at the luncheon, Stephanie talked about how amazing it was that we had a, we could come here and spend a whole day on parking, you know, and you guys are the real diehards because you're still here, but, you know, it's the same with every other industry, you know, it's just that this is our industry, you know, there's probably somewhere across the country, there's probably a, a bunch of furniture professionals having a chair summit, you know, right now, you know. And, and it's very similar to what we're doing. You know, I, I'm talking about these amazing technologies. We have multi-space parking meters, you know, and the chair people have couches, I suppose. You know, I, don't, I don't know. And, you know, in the parking business, we talk about how important it is to, to we complain about not getting a seat at that planning table, you know. But at the chair conferences, they have no problem getting a seat, of course. Their problem is they couldn't find parking or they're complaining about how much it is. So, so what we're going to do this afternoon is solve their problems. You know, we're going to make sure that we can make sure they can find a parking space when they get to their conference. And we're going to do that with three presentations. The first one you can see is going to be Tom Daniel. Uh, he's from the city of Gloucester. He's going to talk about parking reform with the city of Salem. And then next up, Ron Ross from the Mass Bay Transportation Authority. He's going to talk about uh, the pay by cell phone implementation, implementation they did. And then Andy Hill from Desmond and Associates is going to talk about the new technologies that are trending today, the kinds of things you can look for and, and some of the, uh, I guess, the uh, things to, to look forward to and the things to be careful about. So it's, it's going to be uh, quite an interesting uh, hour, an hour and 15 minutes. We're going to hold the questions till the end. So as they, they said upstairs, you know, write the questions down and pass them up at the front. You don't need to do that unless you're going to write it on a $20 bill and pass it all down. But, but just write them down so you don't forget. If you have a question for Tom, please do jot it down so that you don't forget when we get around to the, to the uh, third presentation and we say, now are the questions. You may not remember what your question was. We certainly will have time and do want to answer it. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first uh, presentation. Our first speaker is Tom Daniel. He's the Community Development Director for the City of Gloucester, Massachusetts. Prior to that, Tom was the Economic Development Manager for the City of Salem. He's a graduate of Grinnell College and has a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Minnesota. He's a German Marshall Memorial Fellow, a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners, and a member of the Urban Land Institute. Tom's work in Gloucester is focused on continuing to support the vibrancy of Gloucester with its diverse economy and numerous amenities. Tom's been using both low-tech and high-tech tools in his quest for significant and lasting parking reform. And today he's going to share some of his experiences with the city of Salem. Tom Daniel. Thank you, Dan, and, and thank you uh, for coming this afternoon. It, it is the diehard group. Um, so you, you heard about Salem some this morning from Lynn Duncan and Rena Sostuk, and uh, MAPC had asked me to talk a little bit more about Salem, some of the process. I'm not, I'm not the tech guy this afternoon, but during the course of the story that I'm going to tell about Salem, um, I'll share some of our experiences. So I hope that it'll help you in your own uh, journey as you look at parking reform in your communities. And uh, I invite you to come up to Gloucester, where I work now, and enjoy Gloucester and all it has to offer. And on your way home, you can stop by Salem and check out the parking, but then keep on driving. Uh, so just to, to set the context a little bit for Salem uh, from a regulatory perspective, the zoning code in Salem allows for uh, parking to be provided off-site for residential conversion and existing buildings. If it's new construction, the parking has to be provided on site. Um, and there's no requirements for commercial um, uses and in terms of parking. So that was important. And the, the public, uh, the parking supply is made up of about 2,300 public spaces. There's two parking garages, 10 lots, on-street spaces, and there's about 2,500 private spaces. 
In 2010, the city uh, installed its first uh, new technology, a parking uh, kiosk. And I wanted to, this is, uh, this parking lot, it's actually two parking lots. It, it, it is, plays an important role in, in the parking story in Salem. So it's the Church Street West lot and the Church Street East lot. And although they're right next to each other, they function differently. The, the one on the west side uh, was one where you came in, pulled a ticket, and you stayed as long as you wanted to stay, and you paid a person when you left, unless you left after 6 o'clock, in which case you got to park for free. Um, the lot on the right was metered. And although they're right next door to each other and they're serving the same people, it cost you $1.50 to park here, and it cost you 50 cents to park here. So that, that didn't make a lot of sense on the face of it. And um, again, my, my background is in economic development. It, it's not in parking. I started in this parking work uh, because of a redevelopment question. This property is owned by the Salem Redevelopment Authority. We were looking at what made sense in terms of a higher and better use for this parking lot. And the uh, Urban Land Institute came to town and did a technical assistance panel with us. Um, and it was great. And one of the uh, things that they asked was, well, how is your parking operating now? Um, the conventional thinking had been that there's parking here now, so you know, build more parking. Um, and you know, right across the street from here is, is a large parking garage with about 1,000 spaces. And they said, oh, so your, your parking garage must be full all the time. And we said, well, no, it fills up during a snow emergency and perhaps you know, once in October. And they said, well, you know, you probably want to look at that before you go spending money on a new parking garage, which made sense to all of us on, uh, on the staff, but was something that was uh, a new idea for people in the community. But I must say, um, at the public meeting that ULI held in the evening, our longest serving city councilor who was first elected in 1968 stood up and said, since 1968, I have thought that there should be a parking garage built on this site and you have convinced me otherwise. And, and that was extremely powerful <laughs> to hear that. And it, we didn't have hard data, we just knew the basic fact that the garage across the street wasn't full. So you know it doesn't make sense to build a garage. But for, for that counselor, uh, senior member of uh, the council to stand up and say that, uh, just revealed the importance of data, which is, is one of the points that I, I wanna carry through here. But going back to our first foray into technology. Um, uh, this pay station was installed on the west side, that western lot, um, and became a great source of uh, trouble. Um, it went on and on for months and months and months. And fortunately, I was not involved in that. Again, I'm economic development. I'm not parking um, operations. And I thought, oh, it's just people having a hard time with you know, getting used to technology. Um, what it was was a paradigm shift. Because again, this was a lot where you used to be able to pull in, you grab a ticket, you stay as long as you want, and then you leave. You pay and you leave. Unless it was after 6 p.m. when you didn't have to pay anything. Um, this changed it. You had a, you had a, when you parked, you had to figure out how long you're gonna stay there and how much you had to pay. So that was a huge um, obstacle for people. And there wasn't communication about that. The city didn't tell anyone about that. There were businesses that had provided coupons to their customers to park in this lot. Those coupons no longer worked, and none of that work, none of that communication had happened. So that was one barrier. I must say, though, that this, this, this particular device was not the right fit for Salem. It was um, a confusing interface. It's, I don't want to speak poorly of the manufacturer, and I'm sure this model's not even available anymore, but it was a, uh, it's a pay-by-space lot. You entered your number here. If you paid with coins, you put money there. If you were paying with bills, you put bills there. If you paid with a credit card, you paid there. You know, it's different levels. Um, then you get this little tiny uh, screen. Um, then you have to keep following directions there. And if you make a mistake, you press that button, but you might not press that button. And then it just was incredibly confusing. And this display where there were buttons pointing, you know, telling you how much you could pay. And if you maxed out, um, I, I won't go on and on. But I, I, I would stop and I'd visit with people and you know, very intelligent people who have used these devices in other parts of the world were you know, on the edge of tears because they feel like they had paid $28 for their hour of parking because they couldn't figure out how to do it. And it um, so that was a barrier. Um, and it 
uh, it was in that context that we were undertaking our parking study and looking at other technology. And throughout the course of our work, we were always battling with this experience that was, was really quite negative. Um, <clears throat> here's the large parking garage across the street. And um, so to answer that question, and uh, we hired Nelson Nygaard to do a parking study. Some of these slides were shared by Lynn and Jason and Renus this morning. So I'm just going to go very quickly through them because they covered the information. Um, what was really key to our work was the, the public process, I think. And I, I want to spend a little bit of time on this. So we had a 14-person working group that really guided this study. They were involved with the consultant selection, um, as well as hosting the public workshops that were part of the study. And they actually signed up for six meetings, ended up meeting for two years. They really put in a, a ton of work. None, none of us, except for the parking director, were parking experts. We all learned a lot. We didn't always agree. We had our own experiences as parkers. Um, we had the interests of our organizations, but we were able to talk through things and come up with recommendations that, that made sense. And this, this study wasn't led by, you know, I was, I was the lead on the city side, but it was never a city staff recommendation to the council or the mayor. There wasn't a champion other than the working group. And, and that was unusual. Um, there wasn't, you know, the mayor wasn't out leading the charge saying, you know, we got to change this, or the chamber director wasn't leading the charge. It was really the working group that worked collaboratively over two years and continued to communicate with the community as well as with, you know, the broader community, but as well as with their specific constituencies about what we were doing. And we were also working in an environment where I think, frankly, no one thought we would ever get anything done. And we had a couple members who were you know, very determined. They were tired of people complaining about parking, and they were determined to make change. It may not be a perfect change, but they were determined to get something done. Um, so that was very important to our work. Um, as with any public process, we had a number, you know, a number of different tools. Um, this was during the study phase. Um, the report uh, was completed, and then we submitted it to the city council for approval. And we didn't know what to do with that because there was a host of recommendations and it was far more uh, than could be digested at one time. And so we, what we did is we said, well, the, the main focus, the primary thing here is, is convenience. That's what matters most to people. That translates to the one space per block face, you know, 15% um, availability um, for on-street parking. So we said, let's, let's cue this up so that what the council is acting upon is setting a policy objective, an outcome for the parking system. So that's what we did. We presented the study to them, and then uh, they adopted the um, policy outcome, oops, I'm going to skip over that, of um, getting the one space per block phase. Then they sent us back and said, come back with specific recommendations. So we went back out and had you know, lots more discussions and a lot more meetings. We had about 30 public meetings, presentations, et cetera. Um, the report, you know, these are the findings that uh, Lynn uh, touched on this morning as well. Um, you know, there was supply even at our crunch time. This was really interesting data for people to see that at 10 a.m. there were still 750 public parking spaces available. Um, but we had spots that there was no parking available on street. We had other areas of the city where there's spaces wide open and then the roof of the garages as well, just, you know, you could have a big, huge party there any time of the day, any day of the week. Um, and the, it was also interesting for the community to see um, how that availability wasn't just, there were, there were uh, general trends, but there were also some specific areas where, you know, there's very little availability here in this parking lot and right across the street. There's a lot of availability. Well, the, the blue parking lot didn't have a sign that said, this is public parking. And people didn't, people assumed it was private parking. Um, our regulations were confusing. We had 13 flavors of parking that Jason mentioned this morning. Our pricing didn't make sense. We were charging three times as much to park in the garage where no one wanted to be as we were for the on-street spaces. So again, the council adopted these, um, these outcomes. We came back with recommendations using relative pricing and providing some other um, options. I'm just going to whiz through these because, again, these were touched on this morning. 
But I did want to note, number one here, this was just basic housekeeping things, you know, getting our signage right, uh, providing good customer service, um, removing excess, uh, barriers uh, to accessibility, things like that. Relative pricing, we shifted from 50 cents everywhere to having three tiers of on-street pricing. Our downtown garages, uh, we dropped the prices. One of them went down to 25 cents, and then all the parking lots changed as well. So our high uh, demand area, which is the yellow zone, was $1.50, and then the lowest cost option was down here at the waterfront garage, which dropped to 25 cents. Again, we're trying to uh, balance utilization. We changed our pass program. As Rena's talked about this morning, we instituted a low, pass, a low cost monthly pass option for 25 bucks in a more remote parking area, extended our time limits, uh, revised enforcement hours and fines. We were at 15 bucks. A lot of people said, you know, I'm willing to get a ticket. We went for 35 bucks. The city council thought that was too high, so we settled at 25. Um, which was enough of a sting for people to start thinking about changing their behavior. Um, how did it go? Uh, this I wanted to talk about shifting into implementation. So again, this um, working group, 14 member working group was key throughout our study, our policy recommendations and adoption by the city council. They stayed involved, but it was really a city staff implementation team that took over at that point about finding out what technology made sense, what we could afford, what the timeline for installation was going to be. And I just offer this, it's obvious things, but just reflect on your own organizations and where you have differences in cultures or systems and knowledge. And those challenges that you have today, you're going to have tomorrow. And as you're looking at implementing change, you're going to need to address some of those um, <coughs> challenges. One thing that we didn't include in our process was our hearing officer and our meter control people. They, they get involved late in our, in our process. They were key in our implementation and it would have been good to have had them involved sooner. Um, regarding technology, it's not all the same and it comes with its own issues. So this experience, which really, uh, you know, I can't overstate how much time was spent on, on these kiosks. Um, we had a vendor come in with a new uh, kiosk we were almost in tears when this uh, sales rep left because uh, this interface just was uh, something that was intuitive and worked for our community. Um, we went with smart meters in our high price uh, on street zone, the $1.50 um, area, and they have uh, the sensors in the pavement as well. Um, it's worked very well, but there were some sensors that just there was something tricky with them and they would go off or not reset when they were supposed to, and so people were contesting tickets. That's why your hearing officer is really important because he or she is getting all those complaints. Um, this was an issue, you know, you gotta make sure that your poles are the right height. <laughs> this is not an optical illusion. This is Gloria who is fantastic, but Gloria, you know, who's 5'1", could not read the meter <laughs> because the pole was way too tall. Um, Timing's really important. What happened in our implementation, this is, uh, Rena's touched on this as well. Uh, one area that uh, was, um, uh, had been free parking. Uh, we were installing meters there. The meter poles went in and there was a delay of about six weeks before the meter heads were gonna be installed. And the business there was a little grocery store, Steve's Market, nice people. Um, they, you know, just couldn't accept the fact that there were going to be meters in front of their business, despite the fact that they had an 18 stall private parking lot, which is a very rare thing in Salem. Um, and they started a petition drive and they got thousands of people to sign a petition to have uh, no meters there. And, and they were successful. And so we paid to install the meter poles and then we paid to have the meter poles removed. Um, and what we were asking for is saying, well, just, you know, give it three months time, give it three months time. But, but there was just no willingness to test that. And had we been, had the meter heads gone in, then they would have been there. And I think, you know, people would have said, well, they're there, try it out for three months. We'll see how it goes. The decision at the end of that may have been to remove them, but, um, it wasn't even given a shot. Um, I can't under, I can't overestimate, overstate uh, how important a, a good communications plan is. So these are signs that were in Salem. The one on the left, it's hard to read. 
Uh, the ones that you can read were actually inaccurate, so it's saying that you know, the meters were enforced for hours that they actually weren't enforced. Um, someone got a ticket for parking here, and they went and said, you know, what am I doing wrong? And the hearing officer said, I have no idea, because the sign is blank. Um, so just getting new signage installed. It's, it's low tech, it's something you can do today. It does a lot for customer service. What you're doing is providing clarity, you're providing good information to your users. We added stickers to the meters, um, you know, color coded for the on-street zone, um, as well as labels where you put in your money to say, you know, you, you, you gotta know. Um, we're giving you lots of opportunities here to get the information that you gotta park here. And we also put in um, signage at all the parking lots that included a map so you knew where you were, you knew what the, the rules were for that parking lot. Um, we also developed a website that was um, specific for uh, the parking changes, but had all the maps, it had you know, how you could get a monthly pass at the discounted rate, um, and we generated some brochures that were uh, really important to getting out to businesses, to get to customers. Um, the monthly passes, again, were focused on um, employees, so this was a really uh, useful tool for business people to hand it to their employees um, to sign up for that. Implementation, um, you know, of course, people didn't like having to pay for things that uh, had used to be free, and uh, they didn't like some of the enforcement hour changes because they, some people started getting tickets. What people did love, though, were the pricing changes. The waterfront garage being at 25 cents became this, this great thing for a lot of people. They had to walk a little further, but they could save money. The monthly zone that was that low cost parking option was really um, very well received. And uh, smart meters were huge. And then people just loved the brochures and the website. It was, it was funny, but people were just so thrilled to have um, something simple where they could get information. Um, so we were effective in meeting the council's objective of having one space open per block face. Um, we were able to balance the utilization, and there was a decrease in the overall number of tickets written, which was a good thing. Um, for us, the revenue, this was a revenue neutral operation. Um, a lot of revenue came from tickets, and we wanted to reduce the number of tickets because the worst thing after having a wonderful meal or shopping experience is to come back and, and find a ticket on your uh, windshield. So just a couple last points. Again, data, it's important throughout from setting up. Um, as well as throughout to evaluate educating and outreach and having partnership um, from the very beginning was really essential to our success in Salem. Um, make sure the technology is right for you. What, what worked in Salem may not be the right fit for you. Um, consider low-tech things that you can uh, do today um, or as you're implementing change, just remember, you know, think basic communication clarity for people. And and you're managing a system, and it's, it's never done. I mean, one of the challenges that Rena spoke about today is that there were a lot of us that were key in terms of implementing this are no longer with the city of Salem, and there's a gap in terms of the management of the system now. Um, but you need to maintain it. You need to evaluate it. We, we conducted um, measurements in terms of how utilization was going, and uh, you, you tweak and go from there. So um, thank you, and look forward to your questions later on. That's great. And Professor Shoup talked about the dogs and the cats, so I guess he was a lion. Our next present presentation is going to be by Ron Ross. Ron Ross is the Director of Parking Services for the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority. Ron is a certified parking professional, a former board member on the New England Parking Council and a certified administrator of public parking candidate with the International Parking Institute. The MBTA has the largest off-street parking operation in New England, consisting of 108 parking facilities with over 50,000 spaces, grossing more than $42 million last year. Today, Ron will be speaking about the MBTA's use of pay-by-sell technology. The MBTA was one of the first major parking providers to offer pay-by-sell parking to their customers. And they've been doing so for more than four years. Ron is going to tell us a little bit about the program, how the public responded, and some lessons he's learned along the way. Ron Ross. I'm going to stand up if that's all right, everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, before getting to my own... Uh, presentation. I just want to comment, you know, good job, Tom, and, and, and I just wanted to bring your attention to the parking sign 
that he had that was blank and, and the customer said, what did I do wrong? And, and it sounds like you're hearing an officer let him off. Well, I have that same situation in a local town that I won't mention, Brockton. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what did I do wrong? And they said, it's a no parking sign. So uh, I brought it to a hearing and uh, I was denied. I gave you guys $35, so I thought that was kind of funny. Um, but uh, Dan, <laughs> you're, you're welcome, you're welcome. Uh, Dan, thanks for that introduction. I, I appreciate that. And uh, you did leave out the, um, the word parking superhero I wanted you to get in there. But uh, anyway, as you look at this slide, I know you're excited that I'm about to talk about MBTA parking for 15 minutes. And uh, I, <laughs> I know that, uh, <laughs> I know that um, the good news is uh, that's not true. The bad news is it's sort of true. But so. As I go to the first slide, you know, I show you this for a couple of reasons. It's to give you a sense of how big the MBT parking is, um, and it's to do a little bit of bragging about us being the largest proprietor of off-street parking in New England. I've been told that for many years. I have no idea if it's true. <laughs> but if politicians can say it, I can say it. So. Uh, but we have 50,000 spaces, 108 facilities, um, and last year we did 42 million gross and 31.9 million net. Um, we have four parking groups broken up geographically. Uh, we're quite large. We go from Worcester to Plymouth in, in um, Providence to Rockport. We have t four groups, like I said, we have 25, at least 25 groups, um, parking lots in each group. We bid each group individually. So Laz Parking uh, actually won the low bid for all four groups. They manage all of our parking for us. Um, so our numbers are pretty big, and so is our, you know, our, our geographical area, as I, as I mentioned. Out of those, if we go back one, out of these 108 facilities, 80 facilities are where we offer pay-by-phone technology. So how did we become the first parking company to go, or one of the first to go system-wide for pay-by-phone technology? Well, I'm glad you asked. In early 2010, we started with a pilot with Varus. The pilot actually had pretty good results, 10% um, adoption rate. So we realized we could move forward with it. In July 2010, we launched pay-by-cell technology system-wide with Park Mobile. They had a three-year-plus contract. The initial adoption rate was 15%, which was pretty good for the MBTA. One of our goals at the MBTA is to become a cashless payment system, system-wide, actually. Um, the rate steadily grew from you know, 15 to 25% where it stayed for a while. In February 2014, we transitioned to pay-by-phone technologies to a low-bid process. Um, they have a four-year contract plus a, a two-year extension option. Despite where I put the decimal point right there, it's 12.9 cents per transaction. Um, MBTA pays the credit card fees. We have electronic monthly permits, which is a big hit for us. And for the extensive advertisement of changing providers, on the first week, we gained an additional 2,000 daily transactions. Um, other benefits to MBTA I spoke about number one, which is it eliminates cash from our system. Um, but by eliminating the cash, we actually get quicker deposits, which my CFO appreciates. Uh, the system is easy to download. You can use it on your, on your app. You can call in your transaction, or you can go to your computer and place the transaction. Another benefit, which is vital in our honor box systems, um, is proof of payment, which our customers for years have been crying for, which they now have. So again, we want to go cashless at MBTA, and it happened slowly. But on April 1st, 2014, after we transitioned to pay by phone, we had 7,672 daily transactions. If you combine that with our 2,000 monthly permits, we had 9,672 total transactions on that day alone. What that means is a 48% adoption rate where pay by phone was option, uh, offered. That's outstanding numbers for the MBTA. We went from 15 to 25 to 48. And we went from 25 to 48 just by advertising to go to a new vendor. Um, those numbers 
uh, are, um, represent taking $37,000 a day of hard to collect and hard to account for cash out of the system. If you times 37,000 by five days a week, it's $186,000 a week times 52 weeks, we have the possibility of removing $9,711,000 of cash out of our system. That's, that's very important for us. We still have an old, older, antique-ish, <laughs> on a box system. Uh, so, these, so these are great numbers for the MBTA. Uh, the system that we have now is very, very simple to use. Uh, it's pay by phone. This is the payment conf confirmation page. So you actually have already entered your information at this point, and this lets you confirm it. But basically, you enter your, your um, location number, your space number, your uh, license plate, what day it is, and how much, how much it costs, which default. And actually, all of this information can default if somebody uses the same pop, um, parking lot frequently. So at that point, you just hit Confirm Parking, and you're good to go. And what that does is allows us to now send you the proof of payment that I was talking about earlier. This is an actual um, receipt that's sent to the inbox of the person who, who placed the parking. It talks about the stall number, the, the location, license plate, everything you need to know to confirm it, plus a transaction number. This has been vital for the MBTA. Um, we issue 250,000 parking tickets a year and this has helped us really move along our appeals process. It's good for the customer. It's good for our, our customer service department. <clears throat> if you're interested in pay by phone as a, as a local city or town, there's some good news because we can, we've actually put a clause into our contract that allows cities and towns within our area to take advantage of the 12.9 cent transaction fee. Uh, the other, the other parts of it like advertising and stuff like that you can negotiate yourself with pay by phone but it's still a good uh, opening uh, bid price for you for anybody who's interested. MBDA's parking primary objectives. Um, these are no different than probably your primary objectives. Uh, who wouldn't want to increase revenue, improve operations, improve customer experience and create environmental sustainability. Um, if you notice, I've kind of said environmental sustainability slowly because it's one of those phrases for me that's difficult to say. Um, say it five times fast, I can't even say it one time slowly. Uh, but um, just make sure I'm not leaving anything out. Uh, yeah, so, that, so basically, I know that was quick, and I, I designed the, the presentation to be quick. Um, but thank you for listening, and if, uh, I hope the information was helpful. I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the final presentation, or you can just reach out to me directly at the MBTA. Um, and that's it. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Ron. That's uh, amazing, amazing results, uh, amazing uptick. Looking forward to the Q&A on that. Okay, we're going to move right along to our, our third presenter. Andy Hill is the senior consultant for Desmond Associates Boston office. He has 15 years of experience in parking consulting and operations and sat on the National Parking Association's Parking Consultants Board and the Board of Directors for the New England Parking Council. Andy has worked with dozens of municipalities and public agencies on planning, operations, finance, and design engagements. Today, Andy will be speaking about the most popular technological trends among municipalities and public agencies. These new technologies focus on assisting municipalities and public agencies to better monitor, manage, and promote their existing assets. Andy will discuss how the new technologies are improving utilization of existing facilities while reducing traffic impacts and carbon emissions by offering real-time reports of available capacity and turn-by-turn -turn navigation from the constituent's driveway to the merchant's front door. He will explore the benefits and liabilities of some of each system and discuss key considerations to adopting each. Andy Hill. There are only two benefits to being the last speaker of the day. One, I get to 
piggyback on much of the wisdom that has been shared out during the course of the day and, and leverage myself against that. And two, I'm fairly close to happy hour if this goes poorly. So. <laughs> We've had a lot of discussion today about best practices, about policy, about forward thinking. The role that technology plays um, is really implementing that. It is the nuts and bolts of a lot of the larger ideas that we put together. And there is a ton of technology to talk about. I wanted to touch on five things that I thought were very germane to a lot of the messages and a lot of the objectives we've outlined here. Um, and so, in, in no particular order, I want to talk a little bit today about uh, the coming wave of on-street analytics that will help you get the most out of your curbside parking. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about ALPR, which will help you on the enforcement end here um, and will help facilitate the institution and um, maintenance of residential parking zones as well as time limits. Um, parking guidance systems is another way to get the most out of a facility that you've already built at anywhere between $25,000 and $100,000 per space, depending on who you were taking notes from today. Um, there is the potential to do internet sales, which will actually get people out in the public into your facility um, early on and also get that revenue stream into your facility wirelessly. Um, Ron had alluded to this a little bit. The ability to do wireless transactions, the ability to do credit card transactions has revolutionized this industry. When I came into it 15 years ago, about 50% of the transactions you saw out there were uh, cash and carry transactions. As a result, there were a lot of um, gentlemen of the Italian persuasion who were very vested in the parking business. Um, and there was also a typical loss rate in any given facility of 15 to 20%. When you see the institution of wireless payment systems, of credit card, debit card payment systems, you usually see a corresponding bump of anywhere from 10 to 15% in net revenues right off the bat. Less cash, less loss. Um, finally, I wanna talk a little bit about handheld apps. Everybody's got an app today. Um, I want to talk about some of the trends that we're seeing in them. So when we talk about curbside analytics, what we're talking about is the evolution of curbside parking. We've gone from uh, the traditional mechanical leader to the next step up, which was the electronic meter, uh, which was a little bit easier to enforce, would allow you to use a city charge card or standard coins. Next step up, uh, the latest and greatest in electronic meters. These will actually allow for credit and debit card transactions as well. Smart meters are the hot new thing. You can replace supposedly 10 to 15 of these with one of these. It's solar powered. It's got cellular or wireless uplink. Uh, it accepts credit cards, debit cards, city cards, coins, cash, um, and any manner of other media. And this is sort of the last piece in the puzzle here. This is the newest thing. These are the sensors uh, that we were referring to earlier with SF Park that actually tell you whether there's a vehicle in space or not. These work most effectively in tandem with these meters to give you a couple of different benefits. One, um, you can cut down on cruising significantly when you mate a in-ground sensor with a meter because that meter will zero out uh, when that sensor goes blank. In other words, when somebody pulls into that space, they get over this meter, it starts the clock already. There's a grace period they have to go feed that meter. If they don't feed that meter in an appropriate amount of time, it sends a signal out through a local router to a central server that then goes to your enforcement personnel who can come right to the spot and write a ticket. So the days of having to pound up and down the blocks looking for scoff laws can get shaved down significantly, you actually have point of sale enforcement, for lack of a better term, or in this case, point of no sale enforcement. Um, it also zeroes out the meter. Once somebody pulls out of there, that meter, if it's still got time on it, goes to zero as well. Those folks have left there, so you don't get those folks cruising, hoping to get that last hour that somebody else paid for. It. Bumps your revenues up, reduces your cruising down, but most importantly, it gives you real-time data. How full are your spaces? When are they the most full? Which block faces are overburdened? Which block faces are sitting empty and at what time of day? 
the information that you need in order to take a look at doing variable demand pricing. This is the key component here. We talked about the policy of variable demand pricing. We talked about the ideas behind variable demand pricing. This is the mechanics of variable demand pricing. This gives you the ability in real time to look at what's happening on a block by block basis and know which blocks are overburdened, which blocks are underburdened, and also gauge your rate changes to figure out, do we need to go up a quarter, do I need to go down a quarter here? This is the type of apparatus that SF Park has in place right now. City of Boston actually did a pilot with this. If you want to see those in-ground sensors in place, they're actually on the curb in front of City Hall across from Center Plaza. As you walk down that curb facing here, you'll see them. They look like two small coffee cans that are buried upside down in the asphalt. Uh, we've been watching them since they were put in about two years ago because one of the questions that we had in the Northeast is how is this going to work when we have frost and freeze patterns? How is this going to work when we have snow removal? Are we going to get our first frost and freeze, find all these pucks that were mounted subsurface in the asphalt sitting on top and now sitting in a snowbank at the end of the street? I'm happy to tell you that uh, the pucks are in place and uh, in talking to the folks in the city who are running the pilot, they're still feeding some data out here. So the pilot has been subsended, the pucks are still working. Um, we talked about point of violation enforcement here. The most important thing again is the data stream. In order to reduce your parking requirements, you need to get the most out of each space that you have left over. This gives you the ability to know what's available and where. It also gives you the ability to upload this info real time to websites, to web-based applications, and out to your customers so that they know before they leave the house, this block face has three empty spaces. I can go right there. It shuts down, uh, it reduces your CO2 emissions because you have more efficient travel patterns from home to the location. Um, <laughs> It also has the potential liability if somebody is actually looking at their cell phone as they're driving to the location, trying to discern where that available curbside spot is. So there's a potential liability. Um, ALPR systems are uh, automated license plate recognition systems. These are systems where you have cameras, handheld or vehicle mounted, that pass along a row of cars. They take a picture of the license plate, digitize that picture, and then run that digitized data against the pre-existing database. These databases can be inclusive or exclusive. If you're in a permit zone, you're really looking for the person that stands out, the license plate that is not permitted to be in that particular zone. Uh, the equipment has the ability to actually match uh, the location when the image is taken with the GPS coordinate. It can also match it with a timestamp. So you can also use this in replacement of the old standard uh, tire chalking. This is electronic tire chalking. The vehicle can actually drive down the street. It takes a picture of the plate. It takes a digitized image, it stores it, uh, and it takes a GPS coordinate associated with the uh, digitized image and a timestamp. When they pass through that same block the next hour, it's comparing that against this record that's been placed in the database to see if that car is turned over or not. If that car is still there two hours later and it's a one hour time limit, it sends a notice up to the patrol officer to pull over and write that individual a ticket. They are now a scoff law. It's wonderful technology. It's great for catching folks who like to actually shuffle cars at the curbside because you can set it up for zonal um, patrol so that rather than getting those folks in the same space if they're in the same geographic area you can now have a uh, much better ability to catch those folks as they're shuffling the car up and down the block face. They have moved the car out of that particular space they're still on the block face now you have the ability to detect that and enforce against that as well. Um, like I said this is a great function uh, for multiple applications. You first saw LPR used for loss prevention in airports. Folks would come in, park, uh, go away on a flight, come back seven days later. They would have a friend come into the same garage, pull a ticket, park in there for an hour, give them the ticket. When they went to leave, they'd do a swap. Seven day ticket for the one day ticket or the one hour ticket, they pay the reduced rate. 
With the use of LPR, this became impossible because the LPR would actually timestamp when that plate came in and it would come back up. It would, as it came in, the camera would digitize and timestamp the time of entry associated with that transaction. When they went to leave, it'd take another picture and go into the database and say, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Stillian, you've been here for seven days. That ticket's not valid. I'm going to have to ask you to pay the seven-day rate. Um, later on, you started to see it for scofflaw detection. Uh, it still has large use within the law enforcement community, looking for uh, bolos, outstanding warrants, uh, amber alerts, stolen vehicles. You can also use it very effectively to uh, identify and detect those folks who have multiple outstanding parking tickets as well. Um, like I said, it's very good for permit enforcement. Either those folks are registered and allowed to park in that area or they're not. If they're not, the system will chime and send up an alert the minute it hits on somebody who's not supposed to be where they're supposed to be. You can use it for time enforcement and you're actually starting to use it now as access control. Instead of the typical access card, you now can actually use your license plate. A um, lot of pros and a lot of cons with this particular technology. On the pro side, from an enforcement standpoint, it's a force multiplier. You can cover geographically um, several orders of magnitude the space that you could cover uh, on foot, even with a handheld scanner. It allows you to cover much larger, larger stands of space. Uh, it's going to, because it allows you to cover much larger stands of space, you're going to get enforced compliance. You're going to see an increase in revenues, both from meteor revenues and from citations. It gives you a fairly robust data stream. Um, it will give you elevated security in that you now are capturing everything that's happening on that block face. So you actually have a record in time of every vehicle that was parked there. And if you can do it with paired data capture, an image, a picture of the actual vehicle, it also cuts down on your adjudication. However, the big issue that you have with this outside of the cost is, again, this robust data stream. It is the thing that is being most challenged in these systems now. Because you are capturing all of this data, you are now responsible for the care and keeping of all of this data. Uh, the ACLU has challenged multiple um, applications of this in multiple cities over the question of, is the data discoverable? Who can discover it? It's being held by a public agency. Is it subject to a um, freedom of information request? Who can use it and why? Um, if you decide to go down this route at some point, understand that you're going to have to have a clear set of policies and procedures in place, and you're going to have to strictly adhere to those as far as data capture, data retention, and compliance with right of privacy rules. However, in addition to that, the cost to acquire is substantial. When you're talking about something like a permit area where you have to check plate numbers against an existing database, you are responsible for updating the database and maintaining it on a daily basis so that you actually know who's supposed to be there and who isn't. You often have read issues with these systems. When they take a picture of the plate, they digitize that in terms of numbers and letters. Um, within the state of Massachusetts, I think there are 27 different varieties of plates. Uh, with many states, not only do you have multiple varieties of plates, but for each variety of plate, you can assign the same set of alphanumerical sequences. So in certain states, uh, if you have a plate that says ABC123 and you're supporting the environment, somebody who's packing back in the local baseball team can also have ABC123. Uh, so you can have some significant issues with read there because the system doesn't differentiate between those two. That's why you really want to have the paired data and somebody who's actually looking at this when there's an alert in order to make uh, the determination whether this is actually the plate that you're looking for or not looking for. Uh, in addition, if the plates um, are subject to certain types of screening, if they're covered by snow, if they're not covered by mud, the system is only going to be moderately effective. So it's not a cure-all by any means. Um, again, with the credential confusion, we're talking about the same thing. Which plate is, is which, and can they all be read? 
In the industry for years, we've talked about a 10% buffer in every facility. You have to have a 10% buffer. That 10% buffer is for folks who miss park in a surface lot. It's for those spaces that you lose to snow coverage. Um, but most often it is the buffer that you wanna hold against those very busy periods so folks can effectively and quickly get to those last few empty spots. Uh, this came out of early work done by the International National Council of Shopping Centers. They wanted to make sure that on that busiest shopping day, you could still get in and find those 10% of extra spaces that you need against variations in demand. What parking guidance system does is it allows you to some degree to take that 10% off the table. It is a set of sensors that are mounted they're usually ultrasonic. They're mounted over every stall within the facility, and they're constantly shooting a beam down to determine which stalls are empty, which stalls are full. They're hooked up to a set of wayfinding lights and usually a set of dynamic signage, which will tell you. Red, red lights tell you these spaces are occupied. Green lights tell you these spaces are empty here. So it is a, in, in a well thought out design, it is a system which will guide you from the minute you come into the garage all the way into that first empty space closest to where you've come in. Uh, again, now you're not designing a 10% buffer against these peak periods uh, because you are getting every last space into play and into use with great efficiency uh, and point-to-point -point wayfinding. So you're recapturing that 10%. We just did a cost benefit for a facility here in Boston uh, that's doing about $7,000 a year on average per space. They're getting back 200 extra spaces uh, that were being lost to this buffer of this reservation previously. They now get to put all of the facility into play. Their ROI for a million dollar investment is gonna be less than 18 months as far as it goes. Um, it will increase your revenues. It's going to decrease your CO2 emissions because you don't have folks circling the garage, circling the lot, looking for those last few empty spaces. They're coming in the entrance. They're following the sign. They're going right to that spot. It's elevated customer service. It's reduced wear and tear. You don't have as many people traveling over your slab, and you don't have as much wear and tear on the membrane. Um, obviously, the costs are significant. Acquisition, installation, maintenance, uh, utilities, all of those are going to go up as a result. Um, <laughs> this is actually a con as well, elevated process speeds. Now that folks know the quickest way to the first open space, if they're running late, they will push their vehicle as quickly as they can to get to that last open space. Um, I was in the Baltimore Washington airport where they have one of these in place and I was lucky enough to be standing in the middle of the aisle as two vehicles came around the corner at the same time and saw one green light dead in the middle of the aisle. And it was a wonderful game of chicken here. I'm happy to report the Audi one and the van veered at the last minute. But you do have increased risks of accidents. In addition, if you've got a driver who's actually following this light system around, they're not necessarily watching what's directly in their path of travel. They may not necessarily be as aware of vehicles backing in and out of stalls and pedestrians crossing the path. So that has to be part of your cost benefit calculation. Internet sales are the new coming thing. The ability to go onto a website and pre-buy your parking. You most often see these associated with major events. There are two medias. Um, that are very popular, the traditional 1D code and the now coming 2D barcode. The difference between the two is the amount of data that they can carry and the ease of reading. For the most part, if you're going to use your phone and have your credentials sent there rather than print it on a piece of paper, 2D is the better way to go. It's usually easier to read um, from the barcode scanners here. But it allows you to go onto a website, pre-buy your parking ahead of time, most of these websites will tell you the availability um, so that you know that uh, you've got a space waiting for you when you show up for the event and you can actually use these as both the credential to get into the facility and get out at the end of uh, your visit. Um, again, because we're going wireless, because we're going to a debit credit transaction, there's no cash controls, there's no potential for loss there. It's a much higher standard of quality service. It gives you better data when you talk about event sales. When we talk about um, 
the 4th of July fireworks on the Esplanade. Every parking garage operator in downtown Boston that day would love to know by 10 o'clock in the morning how many spaces they have left to sell. At this point, they're guessing, depending on how many folks arrive, they'd love to know that 85% of the facility is pre-booked. You talk about your variable rate pricing, this is how airlines work. There may come a day where you have garage operators who are selling pre-event parking for $10 at the outset, who go to $20 when the facility is 80% full, who go to $90 when the facility is 95% full. Uh, you actually see a variation of this right now around Fenway Park, depending on how well the team is playing. <laughs> this will still require staffing. This is not something that you can ever do as a fully automated solution. You always have to have humans in the mix in order to monitor this and provide the customer service. And it may require some substantial upgrades if you're running off of a mag magnetic stripe system right now, as opposed to a barcode reading system at your facility. Um, the last thing is the handheld applications. And like I said, everybody's got one of these. We have all this data coming in from these different systems. This is the ability to push that data out directly to the customer here. Um, there are a variety of different applications that are available out there. Some of them are fairly simple. This one right here actually allows you using GPS coordinates and Google Earth Maps to remember where you parked your car and to set a timer on the meter before you leave. So it'll give you a little reminder uh, as your meter is getting ready to expire and also guide you very quickly on foot back there to feed three more quarters into it. Um, this one is for your absent-minded traveler uh, who's rushing to the airport at the last moment. Again, it's a GPS pairing function here. Uh, allows you to remember before you go down to the Yucatan for seven days which lot you parked your car in so that when you come back, all you have to do is push uh, a button and it will give you walking directions back to the facility. The latest and greatest that you're starting to see now, this is an integration with a curbside uh, monitoring system called Tracker. It's put out by a company called Streetline. Uh, it will give you real-time information about the price and availability of both on and off street parking assets in the area. Uh, Park Me and Park Wiz both do a variation on this where they actually will also allow you to pre-purchase the parking on your way in so that uh, when you get there you actually have to just hold up your barcode scan as your credential to get into the facility and you're all set. All of these things are fantastic. Um, they give you a terrific data stream. They help get folks from the door to your facility. They give you real-time information, your customers real-time information about what something costs, where it's available, and to some degree it will even allow you, in some cases, to prepay for it. Um, I deal with a lot of clients who see stuff like this. They go to a show. They call me up, they say, I've got to get this right now. This is so cool, it's going to solve all of our problems. Technology, whatever it is, is a tool, it's not a cure-all. You have to have the policies, you have to have the procedures made it in order to back it up. It's like buying the best skill saw at um, Home Depot, going home and thinking that you're a carpenter at this point. You probably want to read the directions or make sure that your medical insurance is paid up. Um, know why you're buying. Before you start thinking about what you want to purchase, know why. What are you trying to achieve? What are your objectives? Is it customer service? Is it better analytics? Is it faster processor rates? Is it better cash controls? Know why you're making a purchase before you start thinking about what particular type of equipment you should make, buy. When you're buying equipment, make sure that you're going to be able to use every feature that you're buying within it because you're paying for all of them. Um, and finally, know the benefit. Know what you're actually getting out of the deal here. Uh, if you're going to be laying out significant capital outlay to do any type of upgrade, know before you write the check what you're going to be getting at the end of the day for the money that you're spending. Thank you. And so now uh, I'll open it up to questions if you have them. If you don't have any, I've got a few because I was fascinated. Yeah. Um, I was wondering for all of you actually using all these different technologies, how easy it is to 
access the data stream that comes out of them and if you use that to inform your policies or management. I think that's so, a, sure. A I, 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 I can jump in. The, uh, it's really easy. It's the web based interfaces, so you can get the data. And uh, the, the CFO loves it uh, because you, know, you can monitor the revenue that's coming in as well. Um, and with the, smart, with the smart meters, you're, I mean, it's just as, as Andy was talking about the, uh, the hockey puck when they let it up, you can um, you get that detailed information. So it's a very easy interface. To use. I, want, I want to piggyback on that question and, and ask you, or Tom, or, or the panel, about how you use the data. I think, I think analytics, is, which Andy mentioned, is, the, is going to be the new uh, buzzword for what we're doing with technology. In the parking business, we've been collecting data forever, I think. But now I think we have the capability to actually do something with the data. And so I'm, I, I know how easy it is to get the data, but do you actually use it? How do you implement it? How do you turn that data into action? Sure. Well, that, that's one of the things with, um, in Salem, some of our meters were smart meters, but others weren't. And so the smart meters, we could use this easy interface to see how the utilization was going um, that could inform, you know, changes that, or adjustments that might need to be made. The other meters, though, required um, monitoring them. And so what we were doing is we we're having our meter control folks, you know, they would do utilization counts as we were going. It, you know, we're not getting as much data. Um, it, you know, as quickly, but it, it's still um, useful to inform what changes need to be made. Um, in Salem, what happened is we had some really good data that, that we were saying, you know, where some of these pressures were coming up where people, some businesses were looking for changes, and we said, look, you know, we have solid data here that's showing, you know, it's working, and so go away. <laughs> um, which worked in some instances, but um, with the Steve's Market, that was a, a different instance where it, it, it was not effective. <laughs> Another question? Yes. Um, when they, we're talking about the point of violation feeds and sending out uh, notices to parking control officers. Now, is that something that's specific to that particular device? Or say if you already, I think a lot of people are using automated tickets and not writing hand tickets. Is it something that can be integrated within an, an existing program that they might have? Or will you have to like go out and buy new equipment that's going to work with that particular? A lot of the um, a lot of the detection systems, the in in ground pucks, uh, are integratable with multiple meter systems. They usually work with a router repeater system, so the pucks will actually talk to each other. They set up a wireless mesh net where they talk to each other and then talk to a central repeater that goes back to a central server, they can integrate into virtually any existing equipment that you have in place right now. Um, one of the things that the software designers have made is, is um, made what is fairly proprietary software integratable um, on standard you know, Microsoft-driven platforms for the most part so that it will talk to whatever you happen to have in hand. I think our market is moving to much more of an open architecture uh, because the, the public demands it, uh, whereas I think vendors would love, I would love it if I sold you a, a product, I would love it to be proprietary so that I've got a customer for life. But I don't think that's realistic anymore, and I think the manufacturers understand this, and so they're really developing uh, a lot of open architecture. A lot of the software can generally integrate. Uh, different handhelds can integrate with different uh, meters, can integrate with different sensors. And I think Andy and I both being consultants, I think we, we know to write this into a specification. It's very important if you're procuring this equipment that you look to that and speak to that. And I think the manufacturers, they want to integrate with as many as possible. There are some costs involved with an initial integration. So, so that's, I think that's the factor and that's the challenge. And you want to talk to your, your vendors or the manufacturers and see what integrations they've done and, and make sure that you have something in the contract about that. I know at, at Walker we want to make sure that something has been proven uh, as opposed to simply <coughs> hypothetical as far as the integration goes. Yes? I also have an integration question for the MBTA. I'm sorry if you touched on this and I missed it. You've had 48% adoption rate on the pay by phone. So obviously 52% of, of your customers are using other methods. How well integrate? What are those other methods and how well integrated is the pay by phone? 
But the other methods are um, we have garages and people are, st uh, are using, um, you know, pan foot machines in the garages, pan lane. Uh, so we actually have about 20,000 customers that are eligible for pay by phone every day. Um, and then, so the other methods are, are, are cash and credit at garages and attendant lots for the most part. And then what was this second part? Well, do you, how well integrated <coughs> is the pay by phone with that, you know, for data analysis and, and, uh, and whatnot? Yeah, we're just, we're just starting to get into the data analysis with all of this. Um, yeah, um, as far as, as, as figuring out adoption rates and what we can do with the, the information from this point. And pay by phone has been very helpful and we're starting to move in that direction. I don't have a lot of information. We haven't analyzed it at this point, but we are moving down that road. Ron, regarding the pay by cell, I just I have to ask, you jumped to 48%, it seems very rapidly, and I know you changed vendors, and I don't, we don't want to talk about vendors, but to the public, what does the, what, what does the vendor matter to the public? I mean, I'm just, I'm just paying. Uh, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. How did you get, how did it go to, from 15 to 48%? Um, and just let me speak to the vendors for, for a minute. Pog Mobile was excellent. They did a great job for the MBTA. Um, you know, pay by phone came in, they won a low bid. Um, I think I mentioned that, that, I'm not sure I mentioned it, but the second bidder came in at 13.5 cents. So pay by phone won by six tenths of a penny per transaction. Um, why did it jump to 48%? We advertised, at that point in time, we needed to advertise that we were adding uh, or switching to a new vendor. And some of the, the methods that we use, which I have, I have on screen, uh, LED signs on the, on the platforms, and we were advertising that we were switching vendors. And, and to be honest, the 2,000 people that signed up, um, many of them, not, not all of them, no, or, or not many of them, but some of them called me and they said, we didn't even know you had pay by phone technology before this. So it was really just a matter of getting the word out to them. Um, and the way we did it actually worked this time. We still have more advertising to do. The ultimate goal of the MBTA is 75% adoption, if not more, and then to move into the other options by getting in, into the garages uh, and into the attendant lots. And just, just one more thing on that. I think it's, it's very common that the uh, end user pays a convenience fee. Are you subsidizing those fees? Or am I paying anything extra to do, pay by cell? You do not. Um, the MBTA picks up all credit card fees and all transaction fees for our customers. Um, I asked to bid this new one so that the customer would pick up some of that. And uh, the answer was no, because we don't charge people when they buy AFC machine tickets for the trains or anything like that. So we're keeping it all um, the same throughout the system that the MBTA picks up the credit card. So uh, at the end of the day with, and I don't, I don't know my full cost right now, but we're looking at 30 cents per transaction that cost to the MBTA. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. So, um, with regard to the pay by phone, um, you know, 40 percent that's great. So what about if, you know, I don't choose, like I, I could use the pay by phone, but I don't choose to use the pay by phone. What's the other options that are available to people? I mean, I know you said, you know, attended parking and, you know, regular, you know, uh, paying with credit card in the garages, but it seems that, it, it seems, are there places that just have pay by phone or, you know, what are the other options? Right, where we have pay by phone is strictly where we have the on a box. Um, so people will fold up $4 and put it into the, the slot on the on a box. So at, that, at all 80 locations, you have the opportunity to do the on a box cash or pay by phone um, electronically. We um, are in the process of phasing out on a boxes. And one of the questions is, do we go full pay by phone or do we add some pay on foot machines? That's being decided relatively soon. Well, it seems like, I mean, it would seem like if you have a public parking facility, you know, run by the, you know, run by the MTA, that, you know, you have to make sure that there's the ability for everybody equally to use that lot if it's subsidized by taxpayer dollars in any way. So that would, you know, I would just think that would be it is a concern, which is why we'll probably end up putting in some multi-space uh, meters in the parking lots when we when we do full transitions. 
um, because we need to give everybody access to that parking lot. So, I mean, you know, most people will go that way, but you know, then again, I mean, sometimes you have you know folks who are older, younger, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they just don't have that access. So, it should make it truly accessible for everybody. Yeah, that's the way we're leaning. Um, what's happening right now by trying to drive people to pay by phone will help us determine how we replace the owner box and with how many machines do we need to replace the owner box with. It's time for one, one last question. Do you have a question? Yeah, we have a real simple one. Uh, seems like picking up the credit card is a pretty small amount of money given the $42 million or whatever it was per year you're today. So what do you do with the net? What, what's that money go to? That net. <laughs> not parking, let me tell you that. Um, it goes directly to the MBTA general fund because we have such uh, um, budget deficits that it, it, it just goes right to the general fund. Tom, do you want to just you know, speak to that? What do they do in Salem? Well, the, in, in Salem, one of the things, uh, the parking revenue all goes to the general fund. What we had said, again, this was a revenue neutral change. And what we were saying is that if there is incremental uh, gain in revenue, that that would be captured and put back into downtown. Um, you know, I, I left the city a year ago and, and we hadn't had enough time to, to look at, you know, a year's um, change in revenue. So I, I don't know that that has actually happened. Quick follow up. Several people have mentioned that going to these more automated systems, you increase your revenue or whatever. What's the percentage change going from now standard to these future standards? Andy, it's like it's 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 no. it's fifteen percent. That's the yeah. I mean it's well, a, if, the biggest bump is from credit card acceptance, and I think fifteen percent can be conservative. That's yeah. it, it's all anecdotal. And by the way, I don't think municipalities really like to advertise that so much because it's not terribly popular how much money they're making. So yeah. so that's why I say when you're saying 15%, I'd say that's conservative from what I what I've seen. So you gain 15 20% you can invest somewhere. But it, but there is a shift like as I as I noted in Salem we had a lot of revenue coming from parking tickets and that has and we knew it would go down and it went down a lot. And so that's where the wash comes out. Um, so there wasn't you know, in the sort of, I don't know, I think I had six months of revenue data, and you know, it was revenue neutral for us. Um, okay, well, we, we, it's 5 o'clock, and uh, yeah. I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you, thank you, MHPC. It's a great, great summit.